Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Virtual Travel Escapes. I'm Rhonda Svian, Leisure Manager, and my beautiful co-host today is Julie Beckdash. Hi, Julie. Hi, Rhonda. Welcome, everybody. So it is a great day today. Well, I know every day is a good day, but today is extra special. Uh, we have Lynn Vlad joining us to give us a little glimpse into their spectacular Antarctica expeditions. I know it's going to be a real treat and it'll be something fantastic. So it's, I'm just excited. <laughs> And today marks the first anniversary of our webinar presentations. So, you know, we love to celebrate the little things in life and dreaming about travel is definitely one of them. So I thought, you know, a little bubbly is definitely appropriate today. Um, while we thank you all, all of our clients and our friends, we really appreciate you tuning in each week and with all of your wonderful feedback. And it's really been a fantastic journey for Julie and I over the last year. So we wanted to kind of cheers, cheers, Julie, and Cheers, cheers, everybody. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yes, thank you, everyone, for being cheers. with us. And thank you. Cheers. So now we are going to keep on going. We're not stopping. So we have many, many more presentations coming up. Um, next week, we're going to be showcasing Oceana. And uh, they're going to be talking about their exotic and tropical sailing. So that'll be a fun one. So that's next May 13th, next Thursday at 4 p.m. And remember, all of you out there, we may have, actually, I think we do have a, a few um, newcomers to our webinars. Uh, all of um, these presentations are being recorded. So if you've missed any, um, please take a, a visit to our website, paultravel.com slash webinars, and you'll see a list of all of our past recordings that we've done. You might find something there of, of interest that you'd like to view. Also, um, before I actually turn this over to Julie to, to welcome our wonderful guests, again, like I said, you're in for a treat. Uh, today's format uh, for the presentation, any questions you have, please put it in the Q&A box or even in the chat box. Julie's going to monitor it throughout the presentation and, uh, you know, she'll ask uh, our lovely guests the questions while they're in the midst of the presentation. So you don't have to feel you need to save up your questions till the end, but uh, we will certainly have some time at the end as well. So anyway, I hope you enjoy and find it inspiring. Uh, so Julie, I'm going to let you uh, introduce our, our fabulous guests today. Thank you, Rhonda, and welcome everybody again. It's just such a pleasure to have you with us, and it's a, such a beautiful day today. So um, I am going to introduce you to both of our guests today. Um, I'll tell you first a little bit about Lisa Bain. She is from Lindblad Expeditions, and her um, her story goes, she is she's an Australian by birth, as you'll hear by her accent, and she's lived and worked on four continents and has the great privilege of visiting all seven. She started in advertising in Sydney and then headed to South Korea to work for a communications company where she met her husband and worked who worked for the Marines. From there, they moved several times from Japan to Washington, D.C., San Diego, Kansas, um, back to Australia, and then to DC again. And uh, that's where she, her new career in travel was born with a job at the hotel, famous Hotel Del Coronado, as many of you will know. It was their time in Australia that introduced Lisa to her new love of expedition cruising. A chance encounter with Serena Bratton of Orion Expeditions led to a new position representing this wonderful Australian company in the US. Orion was ultimately purchased by Lindblad Expeditions, and she was extremely honored to have the opportunity to stay with the wonderful Orion, now the National Geographic Orion, and be a part of Lindblad Expeditions growth over the past eight years. Lindblad Expeditions was a perfect place to land and fulfills two passions, the opportunity to educate guests about sustainable travel and the chance to learn more about the remarkable planet through Lindblad's amazing expeditions team. And as well, we have uh, Jen Martin with us. And uh, Jen was born and raised in the beautiful but landlocked state of Colorado. As a child, she spent almost every summer camping, high, uh, kayaking, 
back, hiking and backpacking in the mountains, which awakened her passion for uh, the natural world. Um, having um, and introducing um, her to, um, sorry, lost my place, to exploration. She started her naturalist career as a motor coach driver and nature history guide in Alaska. She immediately fell in love with the amazing beauty and wilderness of the place. After a few years, she transitioned to small ships as a naturalist and expedition leader. Having traveled for many years on ships, she has guided a wide array of cultural voyages in Europe, ranging from the Baltic Sea to the European Atlantic coast to the Mediterranean. Spending many seasons exploring the Pacific as well, she has led voyages in Japan and Southeast Asia, uh, through the Bering Sea and across the diverse South Pacific Islands. Along with a fascination for history and culture, she also still has a deep love of natural history, history and the natural world. So currently she resides in the Pacific Northwest offering the best blend of mountains and sea she has found so far. She takes every available opportunity to explore small corners of the world along with the abundant nature at her doorstep. So welcome to both of you. Um, it was just nice to share your backgrounds and how your passion came about for, for nature and, uh, and wildlife. So I'll pass it over to you to take it away. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. So yeah, Jen and I are so excited to be here with Paul Travel. The opportunity to share um, our stories and the amazing places we go is just always so much fun. And I can't believe we get to do it on the one year anniversary. That's really, really special. So um, away we go. So Jen, I'm, I'm going to spend a little bit of time. I want to tell folks a little bit about our history, you know, where we come from, where the company starts. Um, and just share a little bit of that, and then we'll go on from there, I think, if that works for everybody. So, look, we started back in 1966. We actually, this very handsome man here with the lovely furry cap on, um, took the very first guests to Antarctica in 1966. And when you think about it, it's not that long ago that that first uh, group of guests ventured into the far, far south to the Great White Continent. Um, and, and, you know, the the year after that, he took the very first guest to the Galapagos. So Lindblad Expeditions and Lars Eric Lindblad were really the very first to offer small ship expedition in the world. It, it is all about the experiences that, that, that we have developed over those 55 years now of exploration, which makes it really remarkable. And Sven Lindblad has been at the helm of the company now for over 40 years. He is our chairman. Um, he's a remarkable man. He has introduced new ships. We've gone from one little red ship, the Explorer, to 15 ships by the end of this year. Um, he has introduced some of the most remarkable state-of-the-art tools to the expeditionary experience and some brilliant programs like our photography program. And But to him, it's always been about melding the very best in the world with what an expedition can offer. And one of those things is our alliance with the National Geographic Society. I mean, that was something that he was always very passionate about, reading the pages of the society and the explorers that were out there. And it was just a brilliant opportunity to bring the two together, ship-based exploration with scientists, researchers going into the field, supporting our guests, but us all supporting them through our Limblad National Geographic Fund. Our expeditionary team, I mean, I, I kind of have to laugh at Jen. She's she's very humble. She has traveled and done some of the most remarkable expeditions for us around the world. We we're talking yesterday about one of our uh, expedition leaders or expedition naturalists, Tom Ritchie. And Tom has done 160 expeditions to Antarctica. And that's only one of the places he visits and, and leads with us. And so this is what these men and women are about. They're, and what I love most is their ability to still have that childlike wonder in everything they do when you go to a new expedition. It, it gives me, actually, I've got goosebumps thinking about it. Because when you travel with them, it doesn't matter if they're 160th trip or their first trip. They are so passionate and excited about sharing it and making sure that you have the opportunity to understand it both above the water or below the water through our underwater dive teams our Lindblad National Geographic Photography programs, our naturalists, marine biologists, utilizing all the tools we have, like our kayaks, our zodiacs, our paddle boards. And we'll touch on those through this presentation. But the moments that take your breath away is what we're about. Moments like this with a minke whale next to a kayak in Antarctica and knowing, you know, dinner can wait. 
this is why you're there. These are the moments that you can look back in your life and, and are the special moments. You are not going to remember what you had for dinner that night on the ship, but you've got to remember being next to a minky whale for 45 minutes, an hour, or going onto a beach via our zodiacs. So we want to kind of take you through the story of who we are, how we explore, how we share that experience. And I'm going to turn over to Jen because she is an expert in our polar regions. She's going to share, share her experiences. We'll watch the questions and um, welcome. Hi, thanks so much, Lisa. And thanks, Julie and Rhonda. So I'll just kind of talk about what we're seeing here. And then, of course, Julie, if you get questions, just interrupt me along the way. Stop me. I'd love to, to chat about what you're seeing. But I thought it would be good to start with a couple images on Google Earth to just give you a sense of place, a very quick sense of place. You're looking straight down at the South Pole from here. You're looking down at the continent of Antarctica. And the place we're going to focus on is the piece that sticks up a little bit to the top left. That's the Antarctic Peninsula. And we'll, we'll see a little closer view of that in a second to show you how you can kind of get close in and where we're going to go. It's As you see in the scheme of Antarctica, it's not that much area geographically, but it is incredibly biodiverse. It's incredibly beautiful. It's incredibly dramatic. So what you're seeing here, when we talk about these things, when you're seeing the photos that will come up of the wildlife, most of that is centered on this peninsula and that little ring of islands right at the top there. But to give you another sense of things, we'll talk about the next slide that will show you where this sits in relation to South America. So South America is where we begin these voyages. We start in a town called Ushuaia, which is at the southern tip of South America in Antarctica, or excuse me, in Argentina. And we go across the Drake Passage. And I know that for many, the Drake Passage, if you've heard of it before, it could be this looming, scary, scary thing. But it is not that way. And Lisa and I will get into a little more detail about that in just a few minutes. But it's, it's something that shouldn't keep you from visiting one of the most remarkable places in the entire world. Antarctica is unlike any place you've ever been. Ice, penguins, snow, rock, beautiful, beautiful blue colors, beautiful light. There's so much there. So don't let that intimidate you. And we'll get into a little more detail later. I also just wanted to call out the two other places that I've marked on here, the Falkland Islands and South Georgia Island. We'll talk about those at the very end just to give you another sense of place, but these are called sub-Antarctic islands. And the Falklands are inhabited. They ha also have tremendous wildlife opportunity there. South Georgia Island is considered the Galapagos of the South and there, no one lives there year round. All right, so we'll get into the, the meat of it and where this trip goes. This is a picture of Ushuaia. So this is the gateway city in Argentina, in Tierra del Fuego. And you can see it looks like a little mountain ski town and it is in their winter time, but we're there in their summer. So the picture you're seeing here is springtime. It's late spring with snow still on the mountains. We leave from here and head out into the Drake Passage. And during our time on the ship, we have two days at sea, day and a half to two days at sea. We have our natural history team. The man that Lisa mentioned that has done 160 trips to Antarctica is the one in the center here with the big smile and the giant beard. <laughs> That's Tom Ritchie. But these three are three of our longest term naturalists and our natural history staff love this place. And so they spend those two days on the ship getting you ready for the experience. They're giving presentations on board the ship about where you're going and what you're going to see. But they're also with you as pictured here at every single landing. So they're there to share what you're seeing, to share in the moment, to show you how to photograph these things, to explain a behavior that you're watching. And they are absolutely wonderful. We, we all love what we do on the ships. Our captains also are incredible. The bridge is an open door. You can come into the bridge, you can meet the captains, you can sit with them and talk about navigation. You can whale watch or look for birds out the bridge windows. It's a place where you are welcome to come. And we find that that's a really important piece of who we are as a company because that the ship navigation, we couldn't do what we do without that. So these people are very charismatic and extremely knowledgeable in what they do. And that brings us to the Drake Passage. The Drake Passage is windy all the time. Sometimes it's rough, sometimes it isn't. It always has great wildlife though. These are pictures of albatrosses. This is a black browed albatross. If you've never seen an albatross, the smallest ones that we see in the Drake Passage have a wingspan of about six to eight feet. And the largest ones have a 12 foot wingspan. 
they're incredible birds. We also see whales. This is a fin whale, a picture of a fin whale. I think Lisa, you took this picture, didn't you? Or one of the ones? The, I, I actually took the next one. Okay, okay. So we'll get to the next one as well. And these are some of the dolphins that you'll see. Where did you take this picture? Where were you? So this was on the Drake Passage, but I was precariously hanging over the front of the bow. <laughs> okay. So the orange piece that you can see in Lisa's photo is what we call the bulbous bow. It's the piece of one of our ships that actually cuts through the water. And you can see the wildlife is there. We're, we're looking for it all the time, but we don't miss opportunities. So even if the Drake Passage isn't something that you're interested in doing, don't let that stop you because there are amazing things there as well. Yeah, and I might just jump in here, Jen, and Jen knows how passionate I, I am about people doing the Drake Passage. Um, it is an intrinsic part of the Antarctic experience. It is It sets the stage for the rest of the journey. Um, and it is that sense of anticipation as you head across the Drake that builds with that first whale or that first albatross or that first little chunk of ice and the ice gets bigger and the first penguin. And then you see these mountains come up out of the distance and it just, it is this moment of arrival that if you don't do the Drake, if you approach it in a different way, you lose that sense of presence. And I would say that, you know, our ships are built specifically for Antarctic Arctic travel. We've been doing this for 55 years. We Safety is paramount. It is one of those things that once someone gets into it and they're down there and they accomplish it, it is the most amazing feeling of, I just crossed the Drake Passage. I'm one of about 50,000 people a year on this entire planet that will have this opportunity. It, it, it just fills you with so much pride and accomplishment. So I'm just going to leave it there, but yeah. Don't let me catch you not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's true. And, and as you arrive, you, you cross this biological boundary, but it's also a weather boundary called the Antarctic Convergence. And it's the place where the water that's coming off the continent is much colder and it meets the slightly warmer water from the South Atlantic. But it means that biologically, Antarctica is separate from everything else. And when you cross that barrier, the air temperature changes. There's often fog. It's all of this that's preparatory for your visit to Antarctica. So it's a really, really great way to arrive. And then you get there and as Lisa said, you have these incredibly dramatic mountains that you see. The Antarctic Peninsula is like this along its entire length. Very rocky, very rugged, really, really picturesque. But you also are seeing ice along the way. There are icebergs, this one included, larger than the ship all the time. And you can see that the color, we'll see a couple more pictures of these, the color of the ice is absolutely beautiful. And these have come off the Antarctic ice sheet. You also see frozen sea ice, but that's not going to make this beautiful blue ice that you see. And a lot of what we do is spend time just looking at these and photographing them and watching them change as they're affected by weather and wind and water. It's absolutely beautiful and it's one of the highlights of the trip I think. And one of the things I really loved Jen that you don't realize I know, and everyone talks about how the majority of an iceberg is below the water I think it's a 30 to 70 percent yes but when you look at underneath the water at the edges of an iceberg it looks like a golf ball it's covered in these little round little round perfect circles all the way down it looks like you're looking at cathedral windows because they they go from light blue to dark blue and disappear into the depth. And we know that because we have divers in the water bringing back high definition footage, but they are just so remarkably beautiful. And, and you, why, how would you know they, they look like a golf ball underwater? They're just, it's just the coolest thing that how the, how the tides and the water affects them. But I just had to throw that in. It's true. And you could come back to any of these scenes at any point in time, and you'd never find the same iceberg in the same place because they're constantly being eroded. They're constantly changing. So the one that you see is only yours and the people that you're traveling with. It's, it's really special that way. And I mentioned frozen sea ice. That's what you're seeing here. We call this fast ice because it's held fast against the continent. It's frozen ocean. So when we're there early season, which early season is November. We can sometimes find a place like this where we can park the ship into the ice. We go out and we test it and then we can go for walks on the sea ice. And so here you see people pretending to pull the ship through the ice and it's lots of fun for photography, lots of laughter. It's always a really special experience, but it is a certain time of year because we're coming there in early spring in Antarctica. 
So think of it differently in your mind. Southern hemisphere, springtime is November and we can go out on the ice and you'll see a couple other images of things we can do, including cross country skiing if the conditions are right. We have skis and poles, we have snowshoes as well. So if the conditions work for this and we test all of this out, we, we make this happen in the early season to go out and explore the ice in a different way. And it's fun, you know, people have a good time with it and we always have our flag out there and you can see someone picking a snow angel in the snow on top of the ice. And you're seeing different images of some of our other ships in the backdrop, but it's, it's a great opportunity for people to kind of band together and try something they've never done before. And you're never quite alone out there. In this case, you have a picture of some, I think these are, Adele, oh, these are chinstrap penguins, chinstrap penguins that are as curious about us as we are about them. And they're actually coming toward the photographers. So you get a chance to kind of see that as well. Now, one thing to talk about is access to the continent. We're a ship, but we don't spend all the time on the ship. So much of this experience is getting you on land as well. And we have a fleet of Zodiacs on all of our ships. Zodiacs are what you're seeing here, a rigid hull boat with an outboard motor. And they allow us not only to go to shore, but they also allow us to go on Zodiac cruises. So we can use them as a vessel to get you out into the ice as well. And we have amazing boots. We do a boot rental and they are the most comfortable, steady boots on ice and snow. Um, and it's brilliant because the boots can be heavy. You don't want to drag them all the way in your luggage because you do have certain weight restrictions going into Antarctica. So being able to have these on the end of your bed and leave them when you're done is just such 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 a luxury, right? Because you don't have to worry about carrying them. We're clean. We're cleaning them between every visit. One of the things that's really important to us is ensuring the 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 integrity of each of these islands and not carrying pathogens or anything we shouldn't from island to island. To the point where on our um, jackets we remove the Velcro because Velcro is a little bit nasty at collecting seeds or soil. So, you know, down to that point with our sustainability, we want to care for these regions. That's just a little segue. And you can see that the boots, they're, they're a necessity because the Zodiacs can only get up so far. You have to step out into the water and you just, you just get used to it and your feet stay totally dry. Yep. So talking about the Zodiac cruises, this is one of the activities that we offer frequently is to go out by small boat and show you the ice and also look for wildlife. These boats are very maneuverable. We have a lot of space in them, but they're a great way to get you down at water's edge and exploring. And it's, it's a lovely opportunity to see the icebergs and to look for leopard seals and to look for crab eater seals just down on the water's edge. We also, as I mentioned, use the boats. You can see a Zodiac way down at the water's edge. We use them as transportation to shore because there are certain places where we do hikes up the hillside to look at some penguin colonies. There are places where we go walking around on shore. You can see these folks have done a short hike and they're probably in an area where there are penguins as well. So we're, we're using the boats to get people onto shore and having an experience together. And these folks are, are certainly happy about that. <laughs> Later in the background. As Lisa mentioned earlier, we also have kayaks. And the kayaks, when I talk about the Zodiacs being a great feature for getting down to the water's edge, the kayaks are even a step further because it's your experience. It's just you and your kayaking buddy. Choose the right buddy, I can tell you that much. <laughs> I've seen this go horribly wrong. <laughs> and, and we can hear all the arguments over the water very, very clearly. <laughs> but it's, it's quiet and it's silent and you're just out there enjoying the time paddling around. And even if you've never kayaked before, we'll show you how to do it. And we have a lot of safety features always in play so that no one has to feel like this is something out of their reach. It's a lovely way to get down on the water. And it's really cool because we have a proprietary, proprietary dock system which hangs between two Zodiacs. So when you go out, the team has the kayaks, they're ready to go. You just sit your bottom on the edge of the Zodiac, swing into the kayak and you push gently out into the water. Your feet don't go any, you don't even touch the water. It's just such a brilliant, easy way to explore. There's always our safety Zodiacs around. I mean, it, but if you have the opportunity to go to Antarctica, this is something you really want to try because having that water level experience with penguins or whales is just, it's a very intimate experience. And photography, Lisa talked about our photography program. We have two different aspects of teaching in that photography program. And one of them is that 
on these ships, we always have a National Geographic photographer on board with you. And their job is not to capture photos for the magazine or for themselves. Their job is to help you capture your best images. And they are paired with someone on our own Lindblad team. And they're, it's a very long title, Lindblad Expeditions National Geographic Certified Photo Instructor. <laughs> and they are also a naturalist, but they're a photo instructor. And as the title suggests, they're there to help you, whether you're using an iPhone or a big DSLR, they're the ones that are there to, to, to make sure that you go home with great memories. And of course, some of those memories should include wildlife. These are Gen 2 penguins. Penguins are a major part of the experience in Antarctica. And many people by the end of a trip will say, oh, are we gonna see another penguin colony? And I never feel that way because where else are you going to see this? They're remarkable and they're hilarious and they're loud and raucous and they're constantly in each other's little beaks and faces, but they're wonderful. And to see them come out of the water like you're seeing here, they're so perfectly designed for the environment in which they live. And of course, there are other what we would call cetaceans, dolphins and whales. This is an hourglass dolphin. This is one that you can find rarely a little bit further north, kind of near the Falkland Islands. And they're, they're beautiful animals, but it's the kind of thing that we, we want you to be outside with your cameras and your binoculars. But we have our naturalists looking for these all the time. And we always make sure people know when we've seen something so that they can come out on deck and, and get a picture. And I think we've got a brilliant video right now that's going to showcase one of those types of examples down in Antarctica. Oh my goodness. Um, so, oh my goodness. We've got about like 20, a kind of like a disparate pod of about 20 killer whales. <gasps> oh my goodness. And they're still here. They're just over there. Sugar. It's just like pure curiosity because we are, you know, enrichment in their environment. This is their world. Oh my goodness. Yeah, these animals are coming here to take an experience from us, you know? That's beautiful, that's really beautiful. Yeah, and they're killer whales, yay! Oh. oh my goodness, and what I love about Ella is that that's the field of study, whales, killer whales, so she's seen a lot of them and she gets that excited every time. And I think that's what's infectious, right? It's yeah. uh, well every time and we do we see killer whales often down there they're they're there year round so they're a species that is that is often encountered on the way and again these are gen 2 penguins we always say that they have earmuffs and lipstick that's how you can tell these apart <laughs> this is an adelie penguin and these are they're the ones that live the furthest south so sometimes we see these when we're in the Weddell Sea and they are they're the smallest of the three that we see but ne no less enthusiastic <laughs> <laughs> this is a Weddell seal. They're big and they're always asleep at our landing sites. One thing to note with all of the wildlife that you're seeing, any of these photos are zoomed in. There is uh, an organization that we are a part of, we're a member of, IATO, International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators. And we are we are self-regulating. So we have all agreed to the fact that there are rules and restrictions that we place on ourselves to protect the wildlife and the environment. And one of those is that we don't harass wildlife and we don't get any closer than five meters or 15 feet. If wildlife comes up to us, we just tell people to stay where you are and, and let them explore and walk around, but we don't get any closer because when you see things like this and this resting seal, that's what you wanna see. The seal calm and comfortable in its own environment and they're, they're beautiful animals. This is a leopard seal and a leopard seal often gets a bad rap because one of their one one of their food sources is penguins. It's not their only food source, but they're incredible. And we often see them when we're on a Zodiac cruise because they're often lounging on the ice flows. Really, really sleek animals. They're absolutely stunning to see. They're just such remarkably beautiful animals. They are, and they've got that speckled coat, which is how they get their name, leopard seal. This is the tail of a humpback whale. Now humpback whales are seasonal in Antarctica, but they're there when we are there because this is their summer feeding ground. So you're seeing this tail fluke come up 
and we'll see a couple of, of images that will that will go through showing you different views of humpback whales. This is also a minke whale. They're there year round. And they're, this is the only place in the world I've been where minke whales actually approach zodiacs. In other parts of the world, they're extremely shy. But here in Antarctica, I've had them follow my boat several different times. And they're a smaller whale that is a filter feeder. They filter, filter out krill in the environment. And that's why all these major whale species are here. This is another image of a humpback. Their main food source comes out of the water here, the krill, which are like very large shrimp. And they are so abundant in, in Antarctica because the water is so cold and so nutrient rich. So you get something like a humpback whale, this massive animal coming out of the water, and this is a shot of it actually feeding on krill. They're scooping up a mouthful of water and they're using those feather or hair-like things that you're seeing in the top of its mouth there to filter out the water. The water goes out, the krill stays in, and they couldn't do it if this environment wasn't already nutrient rich. And that's why the penguins are there as well. We also have a dive program and Lisa talked about this at the start and this is one of my favorite aspects. We have naturalists who are commercial divers and they come onto the ship to go down under the water and to share with you what they see. It's the part of Antarctica where we can't actually take you. So the way that we can show you what a rich environment it is, is simply by taking high definition video footage of the undersea life and bringing it back on board the ship and showing you a video of what's under the water there. Really beautiful colors. The initial roll in feels like pouring an ice bucket over your head. And then about minute six, the cold starts to seep in in ways you didn't know previously possible. Every minute starts to begin this mental warfare with how much longer can I <laughs> deal with this freezing cold. There's a million different stories that exist below the sea. Polar environments have just as much, if not more, to offer. You always might see something that is either new or will completely boggle your your mind with how crazy the organisms can look when it's your job to go and explore these places and show people what they otherwise wouldn't see you can completely blow people's minds with all of the amazing aspects of the ocean so many of these organisms seem so alien to us. The animals that people in general know the least about are more often than not some of the most fascinating you can ever imagine. Marine animals and their ecosystems and the intricate relationships that they have. It's really my entire world. It's all I think about, it's all I dream about half of the time. And <laughs> reminds you of just how ridiculous life can really be. I, I just love their attitude and, and how they approach what they do. But what they bring back is unbelievably brilliant to see. It's, it's amazing. I don't think anyone expects to go to Antarctica and find a rich undersea environment. It's not the no. that you're booking a trip, but it's an important thing to see and understand when you really yeah. think about the environment as a whole. Now this image, of course, is someone participating in the polar plunge, not a required activity, but something that if you wanna do it, we, if we can put this on offer for you. And again, we have lots of safety features in play, but it is cold. And I can tell you I've done it once and that was plenty for me. I've had ample opportunity to do it again. And I just said, you know what? The one time was good for me, but it's worth it. And it's a really, it's one of those things that you can take home and uh, pat yourself on the back for at least and I do find I do find when when you do offer it and everyone does it and then that night at dinner everyone's like oh you know I wish I had have done it so right. think very seriously if you're saying no because it's a one-time option when we're down there so hey Jen and Lisa just yeah. a question can you this guy looks like a pretty young guy what what um would be the age range mainly of the people on um your expeditions that, that's a really great question because it, it's very diverse. An expedition is not like a cruise, right? It's a community of, of travelers. And we'll have 
my last trip to Antarctica, the youngest was seven and the oldest was 95. I think it's, it's about having an inquisitive mind, being active. If you can do a couple of football fields, you can do most of Antarctica, honestly. It is because we give options, you know, a short walk just into the penguin colony, or maybe you want to go up to that longer hike up to the hill, but you don't have to. And so we, we have all age groups that join us down in Antarctica. Actually, our Global Explorers Program with National Geographic for our under 18 year old guests has been extended to all of our Antarctica departures because we now see so many more families sharing this really remarkable place with their younger children. So it, it's a very diverse mix, but, but expedition doesn't have an age. That basically is stripped away um, because of those combined and shared experiences everybody have together. That's Perfect. great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so now we'll move into the outskirts just a little bit. I had mentioned early on that we would just touch on South Georgia Island and the Falkland Islands as well. These are two of the sub-Antarctic islands that, that some of our trips also visit. What you're seeing here is one of the king penguin colonies on South Georgia Island. South Georgia is, as I mentioned, there's no year-round population there other than scientists that live in one location. It's very mountainous. It has glaciers across the top and it has big wide open bays on sort of the north and east side that are filled with king penguins. They're there year round. And when you're seeing ones like this, these are all adults. The brown ones that are mixed in are chicks, but they're here by the hundreds of thousands. And so this is one of the main reasons that we go to South Georgia is to see the king penguin colonies. And we try to visit multiple colonies. Here again, you can see the chicks. The chicks, the nickname for them is Oakham Boys. I have no idea why that has existed as long as it has, but their oakum boys are the chicks and then the two really beautiful adults in the middle. But South Georgia is a wonderland. You can see the, the geography here too. It is very dramatic, ice still coating the top. And this is the place where Ernest Shackleton and his men landed after 800 miles in an open lifeboat. And then they hiked over the top of the island and slid down the glaciers on the far side to a whaling community. So there is whaling history here as well. Nothing happening anymore, but it's a part of the history. There are also elephant seals all over the beaches. These are elephant seal pups. We call them weaners because they can wean from their mothers and mothers aren't there anymore. And they have these big, beautiful eyes. And you can see, again, the photographer in these pictures is a long ways away. They're all zoomed in, but they're, they're always looking for someone to cuddle. So you kind of have to watch, <laughs> watch out where you are. And the adults can be, almost 2000 pounds. This is an adult male elephant seal and the Southern elephant seal is the largest pinniped seals and sea lions pinniped in the world. And then all the king penguins behind it. So incredible. There are also fur seals here. This little guy is fantastic. This is the South Georgia pipit and it is the only songbird on the island. It was almost completely taken extinct because of rat populations there. But because of some researchers and a lot of donations, including Lindblad Expedition's guests, they eradicated the rats on South Georgia Island and the pivot has made an incredible comeback, but it's a little songbird that lives there year round. This is another elephant seal. This is a female, but the thing that you can notice in this picture about South Georgia Island is that it is not ice choked like Antarctica is. It's a little more temperate. You have these big tufted grasses and you find that the wildlife just lives in and amongst the grasses. Both the pinnipeds and the birds are here. We also can do some longer distant hikes. We can do multi-mile hikes on South Georgia, which are difficult to do on Antarctica because the terrain is so vertical. Here, you've got the grasses and you can go up and over one bay into the next. And this was actually taken on what's called the Shackleton hike, which is a portion of the hike that he and his men did when they were coming down to the whaling station at Strom Ness. We also visit Gritviken, which was one of the old whaling communities and now is where there's a museum and a research station and it is also the grave of Sir Ernest Shackleton and this is where we drink a toast to the boss and that was his nickname. And it's good because we get to go back to a really beautiful ship after we've done that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And here again you're looking at the ship. The ship is not as close to the shore as it looks but it's not far but again thousands and thousands of king penguin adults and chicks here on the landing side of South Georgia Island. And then you just ask it. Oh, sorry. Oh, 
Yeah, that's please. a good question. How tall, how tall are those king penguins? The king penguins yeah. are the second largest in the world. So they're probably about, I'm looking next to me, they're probably about two and a half to three feet high, the adults. They're smaller than an emperor, but not okay. by much. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And so then we move to the Falkland Islands. Now the Falkland Islands have a year round population of people that live there. There are farms and ranches. There are hundreds of sheep everywhere you go. And the town of Stanley is sort of this little colorful outpost, but we, we visit the town and then we talk to some of the farmers that are there. And then we go out into the wild areas because the Falklands also have rock, rock hopper penguins and they have lots of different nesting animals that are there. Most of them are, are going to be birds in flight. So you see albatrosses, but you also are going to see different species of penguin. This is the Antarctic fur seal that you find on South Georgia and on the Falkland Islands. And again, more of that tufted grass, very pretty. This, the Falklands look a little bit like Northern Scotland, or if you've been to Shetland and Orkney, they look very much like that. Similar climate too. Beautiful, beautiful penguins. And, and these are actually nesting into the grasses that you find on the Falkland Islands as well. And then albatrosses, again, a black browed albatross. The colonies here are seasonal like everything else and we're able to come in and see them when they're taking off and, and landing up their nests. And also during the mating time period when they're, they're having a courtship. Mm -hmm. This is a wandering albatross. These are the, these two largest albatross in the world, 12 foot wingspan. And we can sometimes see them when we're on South Georgia Island. And just to talk about the places in general, to sort of bring this a little bit to a close, the lighting is one of the most beautiful things that you find when you go to the Southern Ocean. And it's something that I think people find to be the most surprising. A sunset like this might last five or six hours because you have a hundred percent daylight once you cross the Antarctic Circle. So just above that, you're getting this beautiful long dusk and dawn. I think we have one more picture to show this. This is not doctored at all. This yeah. was taken in the La Mer Channel or just at the entrance to it of one of those sunsets. So again, beautiful light, beautiful scenery. It's, it's without question, one of the most incredible places I've ever been. It's, and, and it changes every minute. That's what's so amazing about the color. Um, you'll have people out on the bow for three or four hours because they go to go inside and all of a sudden it goes from orange to purple and from purple to pink. And it, it's, it's just, it's absolutely beautiful. So I just want to spend a couple of moments and talk about how we do explore, how the, the itineraries that we offer as we head down. So our journey to the white continent, this is probably the one that we do the most. It's a 14 day from the day you leave Edmonton to the day you come home. But this is traveling down either to Buenos Aires or Santiago, taking our charter flight down and then doing that amazing Drake passage because it's a must and spending your time down along the Antarctic Peninsula. So that's our journey to the White Continent. We then have, as Jen said, we have this brilliant trip that takes in Antarctica, South Georgia and the Falklands. And if you have the time, it is worth investing because that South Georgia is it, it's kind of tantamount to being in Africa and that type of Serengeti wildlife experience. The sheer numbers and the breadth of wildlife in the South Georgia Islands and then Antarctica, it's just, it's an amazing combination. We find a lot of our clients who travel with us have done Africa. They're wonderful bookends to travel. Um, and of course, our new favorite, and the one I think everyone's fighting to get onto is our 36 day itinerary from Ushuaia down along the peninsula, that western coast of Antarctica, all the way down to the Ross Sea, and then up through the sub Antarctic islands of Macquarie, Stewart, Snares. This is where you've got some species of penguin we don't see over here on our other sub Antarctics, like the royal penguin or the rather um, rare snare, what is he, the snares yellow eyed or the yellow eyed penguin. Um, and they've got these really kind of yellowy eyes, but they're remarkable birds. And so it's, 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 a, it's an opportunity to see a much broader scope of Antarctica. And because of the way we travel, we are off the ship as much as possible. That's the whole hallmark of Limblad is the luxury of access. We have these beautiful ships and I'm gonna share with you our brand new ships, the Resolution and the Endurance. And we've built these two gorgeous, gorgeous vessels. We're gonna take you all the way to Antarctica and then we're gonna say, get off. <laughs> because that's why you're there. But we have these two ships, one joined us last year, another joins us this year. 
They've got these sexy pointy noses. That's called an X bow, means instead of riding a wave like a traditional ship, they actually cut through the base of a wave for a much smoother, more stable tra transition through adverse conditions. They're also PC5 ice class vessels. So they can basically live in the ice year round in Antarctica and the Arctic. And there are only 69 cabins. And the whole idea of this is it's about that intimacy of exploration. And as Jen mentioned, uh, the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators, that self-governance, part of that is you cannot have more than 100 people on the ice at any one time. So if you're going down on a bigger ship, you are probably going to have to, have to spend time waiting for that original group to go and come back. Because our ships are so intimate, we can have everybody off at the same time doing different activities, but engaged in the destination. So we really are investing in the expeditionary experience. But beautiful recap areas. This is where we do our evening recaps. It's always in the round. This is a community conversation. We want to have our expedition team speak to you, but we want you to be able to speak with your fellow guests and our expedition team as well. Lots of glass because you're there to see out. Wonderful dining rooms, all glass. Everyone has a glass, has a window seat. I wanted to show these, although they don't have all the cushy pillows and the blankets on them, but there's two beautiful fire pits on the back deck where you can take a drink out at the end of a long day and sit and, and watch those amazing sunsets. You have a science hub that is dedicated to our expeditionary team with a 270 degree screen as our video microscope so we can look at the plankton in the water or track microplastics. You know, when we throw a bottle in the river here in Tennessee, at some point it's going to end up in the ocean and at some point it's going to end up washing up in Antarctica or the Arctic. So understanding what we do today can affect tomorrow is really important. There's also a brilliant chef's table outside dining areas, uh, a stunning art exhibit put together by Zaria Foreman on sustainability with a focus on um, the polar regions. There's a wet and dry sauna, perfect for after that polar plunge. Um, there's a full fitness center, there's a spa, massage. Um, but one of our favorite things, and I know Jen and the team love this, is our open bridge policy. But on these ships, the bridge is big enough to fit all 126 guests at the same time. And there's also an espresso maker up there, which just makes the perfect place to spend early mornings. Um, the mud room is more, it's more like being in a ski chalet, right? This is where you leave your jackets and your boots and your walking poles. And then that leads out into that main hangar where your Zodiacs and your kayaks are. And these ships are built to really facilitate very quick distribution of our guests out into the into the wild so that you're not wasting time standing in line. You have different options to get off quickly and efficiently. And then one of the things we all love the most are these amazing glass igloos on the back deck, which have day beds. Um, what a great place to be if you're down in Antarctica with those sunsets or up in Greenland in September when you've got those hopefully northern lights overhead. And those um, kind of bookend to infinity hot tubs. So this ship has kind of got everything you need from beautiful staterooms. These are an example of the category seven suites on the top floor with hammocks and table and chairs outside living space, walk-in wardrobes, beautiful big bathrooms with rain showers, double vanities, bathtubs, um, but even the smallest room. And this of the 69 staterooms, 53 have balconies. So a handful have these beautiful window seats with big cushy pillows and throw blankets again, but still lovely roomy bathrooms. So two stunning ships, which are going to showcase Antarctica. They'll also do our Arctic. Um, we have a brilliant book that we have. It's called Our Six Questions on Antarctica. And if you're even thinking of Antarctic travel, this is something that Paul Travel and the advisory team there, which have worked with us for years and they know our ships, they know our team, they understand how we explore. They can help you learn as much as possible about this destination put you in touch with I or Jen if you have other questions. Um, and then we can share more with you. But I know that now Jen and I would love to take any questions if you have any, Rhonda and Julie. Thank you, ladies. That was just fantastic. I feel I'm just in awe. And I have to say, Antarctica was never really high on my list until um, I learned more about Lindblad. And uh, it just seems like just the most serene, perfect spot. So thank you. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, what do you, um, what do you do with your wastewater on the ship on maybe even on the new ships? 
the wastewater is all treated and processed and we have to be a certain distance away from shore to be able to discharge it. But when it goes out into the water, it's been completely treated and processed. So we're not, we're not just putting wastewater out and we're not putting it out anywhere near the continent. Super. Okay. Thank you so much. And what would be the average temperature? It's warmer than you think. It's, I would say that the wind is cold. The wind can be cold. So add that in. If it's a windy day, that's on top of this. But a typical day there is probably zero or minus one Celsius. It's not that cold. If you think about a dry climate, this is incredibly dry. Think about skiing in a dry place. That's the kind of temperature that you're going to have, a ski day in, in a dry place. It can also be, it's very, very sunny. So you need a ton of sunscreen, very sunny. But it can be, I've had it be in the 50s and 60s, and I, I haven't had it be much less than minus two, minus three, other than the wind can make it a bit cooler. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I know that's one thing when um, Leslie and Jaylene went, that's one thing they were surprised about. They said it wasn't as cold as they were expecting. Yeah. Um, how far, so the ships are smaller and the season is short. How far in advance would you say to book um, and a Linbad journey? Yeah, look, I mean, we've just been through the great pause, we're going to call it that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, being small ships, you would want to be looking now for 22, 23, because a lot of people had to move from this past year. So there's a lot of folks who couldn't go that are now filling into the smaller ships. Uh, I will tell you, we have a little bit of space left for this December and January. Um, so that is certainly an option. But yeah, you want to be booking about a year out just to make sure you get what you're looking for, particularly if you're a solo guest. We have dedicated solo cabins. Um, and so just be aware that those are there, but they do tend to go quickly. Um, and if you're a family and you're wanting to be close together, the longer you can give us, the better we can work with the team at Paul Travel to get you where you want to be on the ship. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And what about... Um... So this is always the hard question to answer, but when would you say is the best time to go? <laughs> it so. is a hard question. And, and the reason is, yeah. it, it goes back to one of the questions you asked a few moments ago in that the season is very short. So you're compressing spring, summer, fall into about three and a half months. And what that means is that things move very quickly there. So there's never a lag in activity. Early season, November, late, late October, this begins, but for us, our purposes, November, December, you're seeing all those penguins coming back to the rookeries and they're busy building nests and, and reconnecting with one another and mating and laying eggs. And then you get into January and the chicks hatch and you're starting to see more activity around that. And then as you get later into February, you see that the adults are starting to leave in, in small numbers and the chicks are getting larger and they're starting to fledge on their own. And the same is true when you talk about the whales. With the orca, the killer whales, they're there year round. You can find them any time of year. Humpbacks are more seasonal. So they're starting to come back in November and we see them in, in lower numbers there, but they're definitely around. And then you start to see larger numbers as it gets into December and January. And then again, that tapers off. The seals are there year round. And the snow is one big difference. Early season, you get snow on the ground, deep snow on the ground, and it's usually snowing from the sky on certain days. Later in the season, you get a lot of mud and guano. <laughs> so not neither is better or worse. They're just very different. One, you're trudging through deep snow. The other one, you're trudging through guano. <laughs> okay. So okay. It's, you, can't, you can't pick a bad time. It really is remarkable, and it changes very quickly. Yeah, I think one of the best ways to think about that is if you're wanting to go to Antarctica, what is the first thing you think about when you think about Antarctica? If it's baby penguins, you probably want to get there when you have the opportunity to see those. If it's that pristine, ice, white, clean look, early season. And I think, you know, it's, if you think of that first thing that you think of that has made you think of Antarctica, I think that's going to be the time that best answers what you want to experience. Okay, perfect. And then another question you mentioned about this, the boots being included, but can you just go over what else is included that people don't have to pack along? Yeah, so the boots are a rental program. Um, the jacket we provide, so you would, when you book your trip with Limblad, you would work with your Paul Travel Advisor and fill out your jacket size. Don't panic, everyone panics. What if it doesn't fit? 
we have extras. You'll see people running around the boat going, Does, is yours too small? Is your People swap things. It, that's all okay. Mm -hmm. The jacket is yours to keep. It's a brilliant jacket because it's a two-piece system. You have the, the warm liner and then you have the outside spray jacket. Um, and then you can, you can pretty much order anything you need. If you don't want to carry bags down through our system, you can order pants and socks and shirts and you can basically rock up to the ship and everything is sitting on the end of the bed for you if that's what you want to do. Um, we also have a global gallery, which is our ship based store. Um, and that has fleeces and shirts. So there's always, I will tell you one thing, people always overpack. <laughs> Whatever you pack for Antarctica, go back, take half of it out and leave it behind because you will, you will not use it. You are going to have, if you think of um, skiing and Jen said it perfectly. So if you're a skier or you like to ski, it's that same kind of layering that's so important. Yoga pants. The most important things you'll need are gloves, a good beanie or toque, um, wet water, wet uh, dry pants, something that is going to keep the water out completely, like over pants, um, but at least two pairs of gloves because if one gets wet, you're miserable if your hands are wet um, and good and good socks. Um, because if you, you do sweat a little bit in those boots, then the last thing you want to do in the afternoon when you're going back out is have to put on damp socks. There is, there is um, laundry on board the ship, so you, you can always get stuff done as well. And it's casual. There's no dress up. You, there's no jackets, no ties. Expeditionary gear is the daily occurrence, right? So we want you to come back from being out on a Zodiac and you're going to recap. We don't want you to have to go back and put makeup on. We want you to go back, maybe have a little spritz, brush the hair, come up to the recap. The, the, the fun thing that Jen and the team and I always see when you're on the ship is the first day, everyone looks so put together. Everyone looks so pretty. And then by day two, it's like a scrunchie and lip gloss. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's great. Good answer. And thanks for the questions, uh, Lana, Christina. Excellent questions. Um, maybe this one for Jen. How, um, question from Doreen, how does global warming affect the icebergs? Or maybe how have you seen that change um, over the past few years, if you have? You know, it's where we are seeing it more is on the sea ice, the frozen sea ice and the, the lack of snow as compared to past years. So with the icebergs themselves, the biggest, the biggest takeaway from that is that large pieces of ice are breaking off the continent and those are breaking up, but we only see those when, they, when they're when they a smaller piece anyway. But what we have noticed in, in the years of going there is that we used to have that fast ice much longer, much later into the season, and it was very thick, and some of it would last year after year. And that's just not happening as much anymore. And in addition to that, it used to be that the snowpack that you find would, have, would be in existence quite a long way into the midsummer and you have snow falling from the sky even into midsummer. And as you get later into midsummer now, those are, those are diminished. It's definitely warmer than it was. When I've had days there, I had a day once that was probably 65 degrees. I was in a t-shirt and it shouldn't be that way. It's lovely that it is, but it shouldn't be that way. So mm -hmm. you can feel it over time. The, the ice is diminishing on the sea and the snow is diminishing season after season. Okay. Okay, great. Get there, get there while you can, hey? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. That was so insightful. Um, just awe-inspiring um, presentation. So thank you both so much. I thank you, uh, again, all of our clients and guests that have joined us today. We couldn't have done this without you. And so we appreciate you. Love seeing your names register week after week, our new names. Uh, it's just a joy to be able to serve you in this way and help just keep your wanderlust going. So I think, thank all of you. I wish you all a wonderful evening and um, we hope to see you again soon. So thank you again, Lisa and Jen and everyone just have a great night. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you, ladies. It was wonderful. Good night.